you got an up close and personal look at the cyber underworld. We have the situation at the White House changing minute to minute, a potentially warmer relationship with Russia. How do you think this is impacting the cyber threat landscape? Well, I think the cyber threat landscape is becoming the new threat landscape. You know, it's this is we're entering an era where everything is connected to the internet. And as we saw this weekend with the ransomware attack, hospitals can be, you know, taken down, um, power grids, you name it. And I think that we're just starting to see the very beginning of this. The the terrifying thing is that, you know, when these things happen, they don't. The government has no idea you know, who is be responsible, how long it's been, it's going to take to solve it, and so on and so forth. We were incredibly lucky this weekend that, that there was a, a very simple fix that was put in place uh, to solve this problem. But I've, you know, in the reporting I've done about hackers and, uh, and some of the things that can go wrong, there are some pretty terrifying things out there. And it's not just computers, but it's the infrastructure that powers pretty much everything we do every day. And what do you imagine is the impact of President Trump and some of his actions on this threat landscape? Well, I honestly don't think President Trump actually understands this threat landscape. You know, I mean, I've spoken to people that have sp uh, that have spent time with him in his committees, and <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, when he was uh, going around to the New York Times and all these other media outlets before he actually became president, and people would bring these things up, and he just, I think, it just is over his head. I don't, he doesn't necessarily use computers on a daily basis. He uh, he barely uses a smartphone, and I just think that these things are literally over his head, and he has not staffed the White House. Uh, with the people that can actually help solve these problems, and he's in instead gotten rid of people like James Comey, who have a full understanding of this. And I think that that you know we were incredibly lucky this time. I think that there is going to be an instance in the not, not too distant future where some sort of cyber attack is going to wreak havoc on the U.S., whether it's the financial markets or power grids or, or what. We have no idea yet. Speaking of the ransomware attack, the currency uh, of this attack was Bitcoin. The perpetrators asking for ransom yeah. to be paid in Bitcoin, which was the currency of the Silk Road. What do you make of that? Well, the thing with Bitcoin is, you know, no one knows who created it. Um, it's only been around for a few years, and it is supposedly untraceable. With the Silk Road, you know, as I talk about in the book, it wasn't completely untraceable then. There are people that now do money laundering and tumblers to, to, to hide this stuff. But the thing with Bitcoin is it, is it goes across, across nationalities, across currencies, across borders. It doesn't matter. Um, and so, you know, someone in North Korea can tell someone in America, pay me six Bitcoins at $1,500 a piece. Um, and there's no way to trace who got it and, and, and how it got there or how it was even uh, uh, turned into, into actual physical cash later on. Now, your book talks about the epic hunt for this guy nicknamed Dread Pirate Roberts, a young guy named Ross Ulbricht who founded the Silk Road, which was basically an online marketplace for drugs, guns, poison. Uh, what are the lessons to be learned here? Because you make some ties uh, to the tech companies, the big tech companies of today. Well, I think that one of the things that's really fascinating is that this kid, uh, his name is Ross Ulbricht, he uh, was from Austin, Texas. He had this very simple idea, what if you could make a website where you could buy and sell anything using Bitcoin and then Tor, which is the web browser people use to get on the dark web. And he built it. And just in the same way that you know Travis and his team built, built Uber and Sergey Brin built Google, and in the same respect, it took off. Um, and you know, a couple of years later, he's on track to do a billion dollars in sales of, of illegal drugs and guns and poisons and hacker tools and so on. Um, and he's cloaked by all these tools that people are now using, as we just discussed, to uh, to, to hold companies accountable and um, to uh, uh, hostage and, and re require them to send Bitcoin to send the money. And I think that what what I saw in the reporting was the, the that was so fascinating was how difficult it was to figure out who this kid was. You know, you had teams of of agents from all over the government, the FBI, the IRS, the DEA. Secret Service, you name it, and it took them. It took them two and a half years, and it was just a completely lucky break uh, that, that got them there. So, is it a call to action to tech entrepreneurs, to the leaders of whether it's Uber or Airbnb or Snapchat? <clears throat> completely. I mean, when you think about the fact that um, you know how we're reliant we are on technology today. Now, let's fast forward and think about in five to ten years when we have driverless cars. Do you think that a, con a country like North Korea needs to worry about trying to get a, a nuclear bomb over to Los Angeles when they could hack into the driverless car network and make all these cars crash into each other, or where they can shut down a power grid by by using the same kind of technology that that the U.S. has tried to use with Iran? And I think that 
you know, when you see the speed with which these technologies go from an idea like the Silk Road or Uber or something like that to becoming a multi-billion dollar business, you can see the speed with which they can be used nefariously by, by bad actors out there. And there are a lot of them out there in the world today. One last quick question, since you also wrote a book about Twitter. We saw Snapchat shares, Snap shares, excuse me, go off a cliff after earnings. Facebook is copying Snapchat features unabashedly. Is Snapchat the next Twitter? I don't think so, actually. I think that, um, you know, I've spent time with, with all of these CEOs from all of these companies, and, and I've always been incredibly impressed by Evan Spiegel, the CEO of Snapchat's ability to understand what millennials want. And I think that you've seen Mark Zuckerberg copy Snapchat several times, and it hasn't worked. Uh, it is currently working with the stories they're doing on Instagram, but I think that Evan uh, has a lot of tricks up his sleeve. And don't forget, you know, when Twitter and Facebook went public after their first quarter earnings, both um, companies' shares fell between 12 and 24 percent. And so I would not uh, be, I wouldn't be selling my Snapchat sh shares if I had them. I think that the company is going to be fine for the next few quarters.